a little bit. How many of you here today have ever heard of uh, the music group DeGarmo and Key? A few hands. I, I think, and I know we're making the trans. I think we got a picture of them there, Chuck. He's probably thinking, who are these guys? Well, that's DeGarmo and Key. <laughs> you know, they were uh, sort of a, a, one of the first popular Christian rock bands during the 80s. They were sort of pioneering that time period. And now, for those of you who have been Christians for some time, you may remember all of the debate back in that time surrounding Christian rock music in the late 70s and into the 80s. Even today, in some circles, it's still there. Now, DeGarmo Key, as I mentioned, they were one of the pioneer bands in the Christian rock scene. And, and I would like to read to you a small little excerpt from a book that the late guitarist Dana Key had written called Don't Stop the Music. However, I loaned the book out and I can't find it. So if you have it, would you return it to me? I've lost more books that way. But if I remember, the, the quote that I would like to read is something I remembered from the book that he wrote. The gist of the expert, excerpt, it deals with with Dana Key and Eddie DeGarmo, the two front people of the band, they, they had come to Christ in high school. They, uh, God had broke through. They gave their lives to Christ. Uh, they had been involved in a rock band for, for a little bit of time. Uh, they desired to continue pursuing their musical endeavor and honoring God by, by playing music in the church. That's what they wanted to do. They wanted to honor the Lord and continue in their area of music that they loved so much. And the pastor that they went to, this is in Tennessee, where they grew up, and the pastor that they went to, um, he thought that that was a great idea to serve God through music. I mean, how awesome is that? However, before they could do so, well, they would need to cut their hair, they would need to change their clothes, and they would have to play a different style of music. Welcome to the family. You've come to embrace Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's great. Praise God. Now let me tell you how to really honor Him by the way you live your life. Here's the dress code. Here's the code of conduct. Here's your accounting ledger so that you can justify all of the time that you've spent. Here's your thesaurus so that you can actually speak Christian language. Oh, what is that? You want to quote Acts chapter 4, verse 12 to me? Well, of course salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. But if you really, really want to please the Lord, then let me tell you how you must look, act, talk, and spend your time. And if you don't, we probably won't tell you to leave but we sure can make you feel uncomfortable. There, now isn't that better? This is not an uncommon scenario. The sticking points are probably different, church to church, region to region, but they're there. This morning, we're going to continue our study through the book of Romans by looking at Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 12, to see what Paul has written about this. Let me read this passage to you in its entirety. If you haven't already, I invite you to turn with me to Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. And Paul writes this, Accept him whose faith is weak, without passing judgment on disputable matters. One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not, and the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One man considers one day more sacred than another, another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind he who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. 
For this very reason Christ died and returned to life, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You, you then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we all will stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Father in heaven, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would open our hearts and our minds yet again to your word. Teach us, shape us, mold us, conform us to be more like you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, in looking at the text, one of the first things that we see right out of the gate is that Paul is making a distinction between what he calls weak faith and strong faith. He's, he's talking about these two kinds of, quote, faith, weak faith and strong faith. And Paul begins by saying right away that we must accept the one whose faith is weak. We have to accept the one whose faith is weak. What in the world is he talking about? Well, this probably stems from the fact that Jewish Christians in Rome, people that had been Jewish, that believed in Christ as Messiah, are now Christians. They're, they're, they're living in Rome. This is a letter to the Romans. The Jewish Christians in Rome, they were having a hard time giving up certain observances and requirements concerning the law. These are people that were raised in, they loved Judaism, the law, all the things that made them Jewish. They were having a hard time giving up some of the practices that they had grown up in. But the interesting thing here is the weak faith, the weak in this instance, is the Christians who are not able to accept for themselves the truth that their faith in Christ implies liberation from certain Old Testament Jewish requirements. These are the people that are doing a lot of things. And it's not so much that they, that they choose to observe the requirements of the law. They're more than welcome to do that. That's not the problem. If they want to keep Jewish law, that's great. No problem. But they were judging those who did not keep those laws and letting them know that if they really wanted to be a Christian, then they would do well to follow this code of conduct. That's what's going on. Now, weak is not used in some condescending way as we might anticipate. Paul's not putting them down when he says they have weak faith. Paul refers to it as weak faith because these people hold on to customs, laws, requirements to create a right standing before God. You know, the only thing that counts is whether or not we're, we're rightly related to the Lord through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what counts. It is weak then in the sense that in their mind, more is needed than just faith in Christ. It's the Jesus and syndrome that I've mentioned before. Yes, yes, it's faith in Jesus and fill in the blank. That's what really makes you acceptable to God. Now, there is no evidence in this letter that, that in the Roman church, these were what are referred to as Judaizers. We've talked about that before. Judaizers were people who demanded adherence to Jewish law in order to be saved. That's not what's going on here. Paul talks to these people in other letters, and if you've read Galatians or Colossians, he has some really, really strong language for these people. The ones that are saying you have to do this in order to be saved. That's not the problem. These aren't Judaizers. Rather, these people, they would skew what sanctification meant, what holiness meant, by adding a bunch of addendums to salvation. Yeah, salvation's found in Jesus. You have to believe in him in faith. And then do all of these other things to make yourself even more holy. That's what's going on. In other words, yes, I know you're saved. But if you really want to honor God, then here's the list that you have to keep. Now, we are told here to accept the one whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. That's a long sentence. That's what we're told to do. Accept the one whose faith is weak 
without passing judgment on disputable matters. We are not just to tolerate the weak. Remember, these are the people who hold to doing certain things to make yourself right before God. We're not to just tolerate them, but we're told to treat them as a brother or sister in the intimate fellowship of believers. We are to accept them. Not just tolerate them, accept them. Now, in the opening story that I shared about the rock band de Garmon Key, the one whose faith was weak, it's not the one that you would think. The one whose faith was weak in that opening story would be the elders and the pastors of the church. That's the one whose faith is weak following Paul's arguments. They were holding to external codes of dress and hairstyle as a means of being sanctified, being more holy before the Lord. And Scripture very clearly indicates that the only thing that justifies and even sanctifies is Jesus himself. You know, living in Montana and ministering on the reservation for a time, as many of you know, we, we came to Cheyenne after having been on the reservation for a while. You know, Julie and I had many friends as did our children, who were Native American. And it was always interesting to talk to them about being civilized. When, when they came and they were actually civilized by people that, that put them on the reservations and things. And I had one friend in particular, she didn't live on the reservation, her name was Nancy. I, I worked with her at a steakhouse for a number of years. And um, she grew up on one of the reservations in Montana, and she has vivid memories of the Christian school that she went to. She went to a Christian school that they had there. One of the requirements, and she's probably about 10, 12 years older than I am, but one of the requirements, even just then, it's, this would be probably like in the 60s or so, one of the requirements for the children attending the Christian school was that they were stripped of any native clothing. They were not allowed to wear it, period. They were forced to dress like Western Europeans. The boys had to have their hair cut short. They could not wear it long. And they were taught Western European Christianity. She remembers tribal elders who, who would truly come to know the Lord. They were born again, spirit-filled, and they were very conflicted because they wanted to please the Lord but they were told that as a Native American, they could not. They needed to cut themselves off from their heritage and embrace an Anglo-European Jesus, who, by the way, is not a biblical Jesus. They would feel horrible because they would, they would yearn to sit in the talking circles and do some of the things of their culture but they were told that they would be an abomination if they did that. I'm sure some of you have seen old missionary pictures of people that have come to faith in Christ in, in sub-Saharan Africa and places, and they're all standing there in three-piece suits. Why? <laughs> it's really hot. You know, my friend... Nancy, she can tell you many, many Bible stories and verses, but for her, freedom in Christ is an oxymoron. And she wants nothing to do with it. And I still pray for her at times when she comes to mind. You know, Paul, he goes on to give two examples of what he's talking about that the early church was facing. These are things that were going on in the Roman church that were problematic for that church. He gives two examples of what the external code was back then. It's different now, but back then this was a real problem. And the first example is found in verses 2 and 3. Let me reread that to you. One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not, and the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does, for God has accepted him. Now we're probably thinking, what does that have to do with anything? This was a problem in the church. This was a big problem in the church. 
Now you have to understand that this example probably stems from the fact that very often in the Roman marketplace, meat that was bought in order to cook and eat had been offered to idols in pagan worship. You would go to the marketplace to buy meat, but almost exclusively the meat that was being sold was left over from pagan ritual practices and offerings. That's the problem. And there's no way of knowing what meat wasn't offered, what was. And so there, there's a more extensive treatment on this in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, because the Corinthian church was really having a problem with this. It was breaking fellowship, and so Paul has to address it. But it was a real problem for the early church. People did not want to inadvertently eat meat that had been used in a God-dishonoring way. I understand that. They wanted to honor God. Their motivation was pure. They didn't want to inadvertently eat meat that had been used in a God-dishonoring way. That's not a bad thing. The one with weak faith in this example, though, that Paul's talking about, you see, they decided that rather than risk eating meat that was unknowingly sacrificed to idols, they would simply be vegetarians. It was easier that way. I just won't eat meat, and then I don't have to worry about it. They felt that if they were to partake in, in that kind of meat, that they would be displeasing to God. Listen, I, I mentioned Roman, or 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Let me just read to you verses 1 through 8. This is 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 8. Because Paul's talking about this very specifically. This had become a problem in the Corinthian church. They were having a big upset about this, and people were all really in camps and fighting and all kinds of stuff. Now, about food sacrificed to idols. This is his teaching to the church. We know that we all possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know. But the man who loves God is known by God. So then about eating food sacrificed to idols. Well, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there were or are so-called gods, whether in heaven or earth, is indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things come and from, wh and from whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone knows this. Some people are still accustomed to idols, that when they eat such food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to an idol. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God, we are no worse if we do not eat, and no better if we do. Paul, Paul says, look, I understand what you're trying to do. It's commendable if, if it makes you sin. But for me, praise the Lord and pass the prime rib. I mean, he had no problem with it. That's basically what he's saying. Paul says that it is the person's faith that allows them to eat whatever. You see... It is the person with strong faith that can just stick to the essentials without having to put a bunch of external codes alongside faith in Christ in order to be pleasing to the Lord. The strong Christian understands that one's dietary choices really have no spiritual significance. In verse 5, Paul uses the example of one day being more sacred than another. This was another problem in the church. This is why he mentions it. Verse 5, Romans 14, One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Again, this probably stems from the Jewish Christians maintaining that the Jewish sacred days and festivals must be observed in order to be right with the Lord. That's what they were saying. Hey, glad you came to faith in Christ, but if you really want to honor God, keep the Jewish calendar. Really, really important. Again, it is the one who places all this external code alongside their faith. That's the person with weak faith. The bottom line is that for a Christian, every day is to be dedicated to God through holy living and godly service. We are to take up our cross daily and follow Him. Not just one day a week or certain days out of the month. It's, it's an everyday thing. 
if I were to boil it down, you know, when thinking through these things, it's really important to understand that we all stand before the Lord and no one else. That's really sort of the bottom line here. You're going to stand before God, not other people. And now in regards to all of this, what does Paul say? Well, listen again to verse 4. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. And he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. And then again, verses 6 through 12. He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who abstains does so to the Lord. He gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself alone. None of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that, we might be the, or so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother? Why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seats. You know, each person stands before the Lord and nobody else. We do not live to please ourselves or other Christians, but we live to please the Lord. And verse 8 really drives that point home. Whether in life, whether in death, we belong to God. And Paul is telling the Roman church that the way to settle disputable matters is to settle them before the Lord. Pray. Search the Scriptures. Come to a conclusion that you can stand before God on in good conscience. Not born out of your own desires. Oh, I really like to do something, so I'm going to find anything in Scripture to justify that. That's not what this is saying. But born out of God's revelation to you through His Word. That's the difference. You know, fellowship among Christians is not to be based on everyone's agreement on disputable questions. That's not fellowship. That's not godly fellowship. That's not what it's based on. That we can sign off on every single disputable matter. You know, Christians, they do not agree on all matters pertaining to Christian life, nor do they need to. Paul's concern here is not so much with the rights and the wrongs of these particular issues. He says, hey, if you want to eat meat, go for it. If you want to abstain, go for it. If you want to consider certain festival days holy, great. If every day is the same to you before God, that's awesome. He's not saying that, that he's going to get into the rights and wrongs of those, as he calls them, disputable matters, but rather he is concerned with the peace and the unity and the mutual edification of the body of Christ. That's the bigger thing. That we can live in peace and unity, building each other up. Look at verses 3 and 10. That's the whole point of this entire passage. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not. And the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does. For God has accepted him. Verse 10, you then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seats. Paul's main point here is this. The one with strong faith is not to despise the weak. And the one with weak faith is not to judge the strong. That really is the whole point. The one with strong faith is not to despise the weak. And the one with weak faith is not to judge the strong. But that's exactly what happens. The person who feels that it's downright sinful to eat meat because what if it's been sacrificed to idols? They look in judgment on the person who's enjoying a T-bone. They are not true believers, they think. Or they'd be eating vegetables. That's what marks true believers. I need to make sure that my children do not go to their house lest they inadvertently eat some meat or they see other people eating meat. I need to call the pastor and tell them that you got people eating meat in your congregation. I need to invoke Matthew 18 on them. Take them before the elders in the church which, by the way, has nothing to do with a situation like this. Matthew 18 is reserved for the person who sins against you, not the person who does not uphold to your moral code. On the other hand, the person who's eating the T-bone, well, he looks at the vegetarians and he thinks, what a petty, immature person. 
They drive me nuts, always butting into my, my, my business and, and, and telling me I cannot eat meat. Then they get on the phone and they, they talk to two other people about how they cannot stand so-and-so. And if they're this childish, well, then they need to go over to the first church of the vegetarians down the road. Letters are written. Phone calls are made. People, they, they cover their anger with some pious veneer, stating that what they really want is just the purity of the church. That's what I'm concerned with more than anything. What a bunch of nonsense. That's the little inroad that Satan needs. Get the body arguing about whether or not they should eat meat. Brothers and sisters in Christ, they cease to talk to one another. Bodies fracture. Churches split. The church is rendered impotent. And and in the meantime, people all around are going to hell. People then become like my friend Nancy who considers freedom in Christ some, some unattainable oxymoron and she wants nothing to do with the church. It's just a, a bunch of pious, holier-than-thou, arguing children. Boy, I'm sure glad we don't have that problem anymore. Or do we? Do we? We can read things like this, and it just seems so unattainable, meat, vegetables, and what's, what's the whole point of this? Well, let's apply it to our situation in life today. Let me ask you, where is your faith weak? I bet you we all have a point or two. Where is your faith weak? What are your hang-ups? I encourage you to examine your heart today. Is it Jesus and being a Republican? Is it Jesus and homeschooling? Is it Jesus and no secular media, whether it's TV or internet or movies? Maybe it's Jesus and not one drop of alcohol. And if anyone consumes any kind of alcohol whatsoever, in your mind, they are less of a Christian. Fill in the blank. We've got them. You know, at the risk of shocking some of you and perhaps even offending some of you, I can let you know a little bit about my life. You know, up until going to seminary, this would be 13 years ago now. I've been pastoring about 10 years and about three years of seminary. So up until leaving to go to seminary, I played in a, in a rock and roll cover band. I, I know. <laughs> I did. (laughs) Now, we played mostly corporate parties and weddings. I mean, that's primarily what we did. But you know what my favorite gig was? It was the once a month, two night, Friday and Saturday night gig at a bar. That was sort of free advertising. But the reason why I liked it so much is because I got to share the gospel with, with people that really needed to hear it you would be amazed how many overly inebriated people wanted to talk about life with one of the band members during a break. (laughs) And the sad thing is, in a way, is we were there once a month. And every weekend, it was the same people. And I bet you they were there every weekend. That was their church, their fellowship. And I had opportunities to speak with people. I remember Sylvester. He was a cook, supposedly. And this is a story he gave me. I don't know. From New York. He was a chef, and he came on hard times. And he was, oh, he and I would talk about all kinds of things. And I had opportunities to share the gospel during these breaks with fairly inebriated people. The conversations were very interesting. And you know, the main reason I don't do that now, I don't have the time. I mean, I can remember getting home two, three in the morning, and this is when Isaac was young, and he'd be there, 6.30, hey, daddy, daddy, wake up. I can also tell you that our our girls have had dance lessons. This is um, in another community, but uh, from someone that I was pretty confident, homosexual. That's a big hang-up right now in the church. I never asked him. didn't really matter to me. He was a great dance instructor. I had a friend in college. I know he was homosexual because we talked about it. He played trombone as well. 
We did a lot of touring together with the symphonic winds and the jazz band. We roomed together. Because you room in your sections. We had four trombonists, two to a bed, four in a room. Okay, so what? He was my friend. His sin grieved my heart. We'd have good conversations about it. And I told him exactly where I stood, but it didn't cause me to disassociate with him. Do any of those two examples bother you? They may. I know for some people they do because they've told me in the past. What are you doing? You're a Christian. How can you be staying in the same room with somebody who's homosexual? That doesn't honor God. Well, for me, I wanted to meet people right where they're at. I wanted to be like Jesus. I wanted to eat with sinners and tax collectors and prostitutes, as we read about. Not so that I can revel in their sin or partake, or, or so that I can, but, but rather so that I can live out truth among them and let them see Jesus, not some carpeted, stained glass institution. I can stand confident before God that I'm not in violation of his word by letting my children sit under the tutelage of a dance instructor who happens to be homosexual when the class pertains to, to dancing, to an artistic endeavor. Now, if they were teaching theology, that's a completely different situation. And Paul is saying that for someone within the body of Christ to sit back and pass judgment on me is wrong. But at the same, on the same token, in the same way, it is wrong for me to sit back and look at the person who believes that a Christian would never associate with a homosexual as not as enlightened when it comes to spiritual matters. It's just as wrong for me to sit there and look down on them because they've made a decision before God. And they have to stand firm in that. It goes both ways when talking about what Paul calls disputable matters. So the question really becomes then, how are we supposed to know what a disputable matter is and what is not? That would, that's what it really comes down to. It, it, well, what it comes down to really more than anything is knowing what the non-negotiables are. Knowing what the non-negotiables are, and there are some of them, no doubt about it. Now, there are things that push somebody out of the body of Christ, but they're much less than we'd probably ever imagine. Paul was constantly being taken to task for his ministry to the Gentiles. You can read about it in a lot of his letters. I mean, how dare you proclaim salvation to non-Jewish people, Paul? He's taking the task over and over and over in his letters. But listen to what Paul says over and over again. In fact, it's the main point of many of his letters. I'm just going to read you four quick passages. But for example, Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10 and I didn't put all of them up here. Some of them are a little bit longer and they'd be too many slides. But you can just listen. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. We read this. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned, as we have already said. So now I say it again. If anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. That's the introduction to Galatians, and he goes on to talk about these very things. A lot of it doing with the, the law of circumcision. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3 through 6. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough but I do not think I am in the least inferior to those, quote, super apostles. 
I may not be a trained speaker, but I do have knowledge. We have made this perfectly clear to you in every way. And again, he's talking about all these people that are coming and teaching Jesus and fill in the blank, whatever it may be. 2 Timothy 2, 8. Remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel. That's what it's about. And then lastly, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. We read this, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, and he goes on to talk about his appearances. That's what it's about. It's about Jesus. Not all this other stuff. Now, are we supposed to encourage and teach and model holy lives for new believers? Are we supposed to show new believers how to separate from the world in a way that leads to holiness? Absolutely we are. Absolutely we are. That's what discipleship and training is all about. But in no way are we to allow dissension and disunity to occur over disputable matters. That's the important thing. Do not allow dissension and disunity to occur over disputable matters. Length of hair, type of facial hair, the way you dress. I think we do have a slide for that, Chuck. You know, we are to welcome believers to the family with open arms. That's what we're called to do. Welcome with open arms fellow believers who do not see things exactly the same way you do. That's the body of Christ. Paul is making an assumption in his argument, and the assumption is that everyone involved is a believer. Everyone involved is born again. And if that's the case, then they stand before God and not you. They stand before God and not me. In verse 4, Paul says that we have no right to judge someone else's servant. And what he means by that is if someone is a believer, then God is their master. And they are God's servants. The church is not their master. The pastor is not their master or the elder board. No, nor is the, the, the busybody down the chair from them. God has invited all believers to his banquets. Do we have any business crossing people off the guest list or interfering with God's welcome? If there are corrections to be made, let God take care of that through the power of His Holy Spirit. You know, we've got our hands full just taking care of our own life before God. It is so easy for us to occupy our time policing the church when what we should be doing is devoting our life to Jesus. You know, I understand that this is a difficult passage. It pushes us to think deeply and it confronts perhaps some things that we hold very dear in our own lives. I understand that. Some of you were, were raised in a certain region of the United States or in a certain church or a certain family, and there are things that are very important to you. Praise God. That's awesome. Enjoy them before the Lord. But if someone else doesn't quite see eye to eye on that, that's okay. It really is okay. We must be very careful not to impose a bunch of addendums onto the gospel message. Now, if there is a professing believer who is having an affair or sleeping with their girlfriend or looking at pornography, that's a different situation. There are clear commands in Scripture that speak against those kinds of things. However, taking someone to task because of their hair length or the way they dress, unless it's provocative and they've got things spilling out they shouldn't have. Or the fact that they're hanging out with sinners. You know, that, that's not conducive to unity within the body. And it will do nothing but just hamstring the church and make it impotent. We're going to take a, a, a two-week break. We're going to have a message more about preparing for Easter and in our Easter message. And then we're going to get back to the second half of 14 and talk a little more in depth about disputable matters, sort of what they are and what our approach should be to them, because Paul goes on to give some more examples. 
Let me just close with saying this. My prayer is that we would be a church that can honestly say, welcome to the family. When someone professes Christ, that we say, God bless you, that's awesome. Welcome to the family. You've made a profession of Christ, and that's what really matters. And then, then I think we can really go and reach a community with the gospel message. And that's what it's about. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this word. And, and this is a hard passage, I know, and probably pushes some buttons. Pushes some buttons on me. And Lord, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to us. Show us, Lord, if we've got some things that um, we hold on to too strongly in a way that we're trying to impose them on other people. Or maybe we don't obviously impose them on people, but maybe it's causing us to look at people with derision, to not accept them fully as a brother and sister in Christ. Lord, I pray, take that away. May there not be disunity in our body because of disputable matters in our approach to them. Lord, I pray against that. I pray that we would be unified in Christ and that as we go from there, Lord, from that place of unity, that we can really honor you and serve you well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I invite the praise team to come up and they're going to